Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of the Baked and Awake News Brief. Today's news brief priority is defined as normal. That is on a range that we'll try to stick to. That begins at low, then normal, advisory, high, and severe don't yet know exactly what will be the thresholds for each of these priorities. Experimenting with it a bit. Feel free to comment down below if you're watching this on YouTube and you have a suggestion for formalizing such a system. Today's news roundup is courtesy of several different sources. They'll be noted as always in the show notes down below the description here on YouTube. I'm going to share screen here from a tab that I've got open. This is a website called The Conversation. Let's get back to the top of the doc here. Um, Looks like The Conversation tries to be pretty high-minded about their journalism and academic standards. They have an interesting looking about page. They say they're nonpartisan, etc. Um, as always, please check out all my sources for yourselves and form your own conclusions. The story, the first story here is entitled, Is Capitalism Dead? Giannis Varoufakis thinks it is, and he knows who kills it. As usual, we'll try not to read the whole article at all. We're going to skim it a bit, provide a bit of commentary, leave the article for you to explore further if you care to do so, and move on. First couple of paragraphs are a bunch of self-serving stuff about his early life and who he is. Um, Giannis Varoufakis grew up in... During the Greek dictatorship of 1967 to 1974, he later became an economics professor and was briefly Greek finance minister in 2015. His late father, a chemical engineer in a steel plant, instilled in his son a critical appreciation of how technology drives social change. He also instilled him the belief that capitalism and genuine freedom were antithetical, a leftist politics that made his father a political prisoner for several years during the junta, as they called it put uh, together, coming together, something like that. In 1993, when he first got the internet, Varoufakis's father posed a killer question to his son. Now computers speak to each other. Will this network make capitalism impossible to overthrow? Or might it finally reveal its Achilles heel? Varoufakis has been mulling it over ever since. So this is his origin story, you know. Um... He's written a couple of books on this topic. A couple of his talking points they go into here. Traditional capitalists are people who can use capital, defined as, quote, anything that can be used to produce saleable goods, such as factories, machinery, raw materials, and money, to coerce workers and generate income in the form of profits. So we're all in the West anyway, we consider ourselves capitalists because even if we do not own a factory or uh, own a bulldozer or semi truck or huge forklift or some other piece of machinery, a mill, etc., uh, or controlled raw materials like a forest or a farm of some kind, those are three ways to participate in capitalism. But all of us who have a few dollars in our pocket can participate in capitalism and coerce workers to labor for us. So most of us are capitalists, by, but the most tenuous of degrees only. That is to say, money allows us to coerce others to cooperate with us and give us what we need. And if we don't have that, we don't have much to fall back on in most instances, personal opinion. I'll get off the soapbox, moving on. Uh, 
getting back to that point, that was the definition of what a capitalist is, coercing workers, generating income in the form of profits. Such capitalists are clearly still flourishing, according to Varoufakis, but they are not driving the economy in the way that they used to. Now he's going to define for us a new class of an evolution of capitalism. In the early 19th century, our guy Varoufakis writes in his book, quote, many feudal relations remained intact, but capitalist relations have begun to dominate. We saw the landed gentry and aristocracy replaced by merchant lords, new, new participants in the economy, new drivers of the economy. Today, capitalist relations remain intact. So jumping forward to today, but techno-feudalist relations have begun to overtake them. So techno-feudalists, techno-feudalism is the term, it's the vocab. Traditional capitalists, he proposes, have become vassal capitalists, quote unquote. They're subordinate and dependent on a new breed of lords, the big tech companies, who generate enormous wealth via new digital platforms. A new form of algorithmic capital has evolved, what Varoufakis calls cloud capital. And it has displaced capitalism's two pillars, markets and profits. Markets have been replaced by digital trading platforms, which look like, but are not markets. The moment you enter amazon.com, you quote, exit capitalism and enter something that resembles a feudal thief, a digital world beginning belonging to one man and his algorithm, which determines what products you will see what products you won't see here on screen we see the book is yeah techno feudalism what killed capitalism Giannis Varoufakis again this is the conversation.com we're getting this uh you know perusing this article from so uh you know can't hardly argue with that um so they go on a little bit here. The capitalists who rely on this mode of selling are granted access to the digital estate by its virtual landowners, the big tech companies. And if vassal capitalists, IRL business, brick and mortar business owners, right? The Walmarts and everybody of the world, um, or well, <laughs> a far cry from the Walmarts, the, the rest of the vassal capitalists, right? The, 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 uh, local businesses and, uh, you know, multi-state interests and, you know, national level, uh, businesses that used to be big, successful firms that could compete in pools, you know, just in their localities or in their regionalities. Um, now suddenly, of course, they've got dollar signs in their eyes. They want to tap into the global market. Where are you going to tap into the global market? Google ads, Facebook ads, amazon.com. It's uh, sales and distribution platform is an incredible place to launch a brand onto and into these days. They're now more important in a lot of ways than whatever those companies do in the real world to distinguish themselves. Because if it didn't happen online and if it hasn't been served to us in a ad, that we didn't necessarily ask for, but which algorithmically uh, and terms of service Ali we've agreed to um, every single day, every single time we pick these things up. And this is this the, the point of this article. And again, consider the source, uh, consider the, the source Varoufakis here, uh, some sort of bureaucrat, some sort of uh, very successful individual who is operating at, you know, the elite levels of any kind of economy or marketplace, uh, national or global, that you, you care to imagine if this person was formerly a finance minister for the for Italy in recent years, no less. So access to the to the digital fife, the platforms comes at the cost of exorbitant rents. Many third party developers on Apple store, for example, pay 30%. Amazon charges 35% of revenues to participate as a seller. That's how much they're giving up right off the top. None of this is that new of information. So, uh, that, that is fascinating to me, this topic, 
Um, they go into quite a bit more detail here. You know, um, they talk about here an entire uh, section on what they call cloud surfs. Um, this is a great um, thing to pull out here. Every time we use our cloud link devices, smartphones, laptops, Alexa, Google Assistant, Siri, we replenish the capital of the big tech cloud lists. This is unpaid labor we're providing them here. This in turn increases their capacity to generate more wealth. How? We train their algorithms, which train us to train them and so on in a feedback loop whose goal is to shape our desires and behavior. They are selling things to us while selling our attention to others. This sentence could have been pulled from the rhetoric I used in my most recent full-length episode of the podcast where we talked about swarm intelligence and uh, artificial intelligence and the underpinnings of a lot of what we see already being deployed widely all around the world. Uh, it's fun stuff. It's really hard to encapsulate in some ultra intelligent way when we're constantly being bombarded with the like the massiveness of it all. Uh, yeah, I, I'm digressing. This is an interesting article. As you can see by the scroll bar here, there's still quite a bit that they go into before they wrap it up. I read the entire article and uh, I think that it's worth uh, reading. The conversation really here is about a transformation, a fundamental transformation of what capitalism even is. Um, they don't really offer any clear solutions. Uh, I mean, this guy pitches he's got a solution, actually. Um, let's see if I can grab just a little bit of it. All right, so here we go. So we're in this techno-feudalist era that he's described. A techno-feudalist age, Varoufakis argues, is not inevitable. I thought we were in it. Despite the difficulties we face, we have the agency to reject techno-dystopia and structure our institutions in ways that more meaningfully embody freedom and democracy. Okay, so here we go. Um, toward the end of techno-feudalism, Varoufakis's canvas canvases some proposals drawn from his earlier book, Another Now, for how to address these issues. These include ending the cloudalist's faux free service model and replacing it with a universal micropayment model. I don't know what that means. Instituting a digital bill of rights and using digital currency, digital technology, excuse me, to democratize companies. With, with decisions being taken collectively by employee shareholders. You know, I'd argue a lot of companies pay lip service to that already today, but of course don't really do that because they're really uh, beholden to their external shareholders way before any employee stakeholders uh, in a company, but in, in almost every instance that I can think of that's worth mentioning. Barofakis also proposes to democratize money, quote unquote. This plan would involve central banks issuing digital wallets, a universal basic income, dun, 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 reconfiguring the central bank's ledger in the direction of a common payment and savings system, and abolishing the currency capacity of the current capacity of private banks to create money, create currency, create money. The proposals are pretty radical, but I think Varo. Varoukias, I thought it was Varoufakis, would say they are as radical as the times require them to be. Did I get Mandela affected in one article? No, Varoufakis, they got a typo in there, in there, at the end of their article there. Right there. Typo. So, you know, sure, sounds good. I, I don't know. I don't know about universal basic income. 
again, sounds great, but probably a disaster <laughs> in every in every conceivable way. I see the downsides of it. I get it. I get it. I get it. How about a universal no income? All right, that's the, that's the first story. This isn't much of a news brief. Okay, I'm gonna remove this guy. Oh, it's in the description. Yeah, so this is a worrying story. In a first, now this is Ars Technica, okay? Uh, pretty fairly well-known technology-based kind of news site. Been around a long time. Uh, you can see here from the headline, in a first, cryptographic keys protecting SSH connections are stolen in a new attack. An error as small as a single flipped memory bit is all it takes to expose a private key. So uh, I got our contributor here is Dan Gooden, and a uh, pretty new story just came out yesterday. For the first time, researchers have demonstrated that a large portion of cryptographic keys used to protect data in computer to server SSH traffic are vulnerable to complete compromise when naturally occurring computational errors occur while the connection is being established. Sounds like a mouthful. We rely on SSH every single day on all of our, you know, bright web, transparent web, top line, top level web uh, sites that you interact with. Everybody who you have a login with anywhere uh, is, you know, their their websites, their domains are all uh, protected by a shell called SSH. Um, these guys did a whole bunch of testing and found that this is this is a tech that we again all rely on and that is while it's a low occurrence of this that they have found right now this is sort of a zero day by my reading of this on ssh which means poor perhaps attackers have been taking advantage of this and aware of this for you know 25 years now, 20 years now plus. Underscoring the importance of their discovery, getting back to the story here. The researchers used their findings to calculate the private portion of almost 200 unique SSH keys they observed in public internet scans taken over the past seven years. The researchers suspect keys used in IPsec, IPsec, excuse me, IPsec connections could suffer the same fate. SSH is the cryptographic protocol used in secure shell connections that allows computers to remotely access servers, usually in security sensitive enterprise environments. IPsec is a protocol used by VPNs, virtual private networks that route traffic, traffic through an encrypted tunnel. So that means you're not protected in a VPN either. The vulnerability occurs when there are errors during the signature generation that takes place when a client and server are establishing a connection. It affects only keys using RSA cryptographic algorithm, which the researchers found in roughly a third of the SSH signatures they examined. So it's still, it's, uh, in my opinion, fairly high proportion. This translates to roughly 1 billion signatures out of the 3.2 billion signatures examined. Of the roughly 1 billion sig signatures, RSAs, about 1 in a million exposed the private key of the host. Now, again, that's just through like accidental exposure. And I'm saying, you know, the very nature and the wording of this story is almost downplaying, I think, to reduce panic. Uh, the possibility that this should be considered a zero day as far as I'm concerned. While the percentage is infinitesimally small, this is what I'm saying, they're, 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 you know, playing it down. The finding is nonetheless surprising for several reasons, most notably because most SSH software in use, including open SSH, has deployed a countermeasure for decades that checks received for decades. This shit has been around and we just trust it. The countermeasure in place for decades 
for that checks for signature faults before sending a signature over the internet. Another reason for the surprise is that until now, researchers believe the signature faults exposed only RSA keys used in the TLS or transport layer, transport layer security protocol, encrypting web and small email connections or web and email connections. So we use transport layer security protocol to encrypt web and email connections is apparently what they want us to take away from that. They believed SSH traffic was immune from such attacks because passive attackers, meaning adversaries simply observing traffic as it goes by, couldn't see some of the necessary information when the errors happened. Okay. Researchers noted that since the 2018 release of TLS version 1.3, the protocol has encrypted handshake messages occurring while web or email session is being negotiated. This has acted as an additional countermeasure protecting key compromise in the event of a computational error. Keegan Ryan, a researcher at the University of California, San Diego, and one of the authors of the research has suggested that it may be time for other protocols to include the same additional protection. So maybe they can't even... <clears throat> figure out yet how to totally patch this in SSH, but they're just going to add more redundancies, I guess, uh, to try to pick up the slack. I guess the takeaway for us is, you know, the web is continues to be less safe than you think, less secure than you hope it is. And that even when you're taking certain measures such as you know, a, a good best practice of trying to use something like a VPN. Uh, they've been controversial lately. VPNs have been, you know, vulnerable to uh, their own attacks and, and uh, failures and, and leaks uh, of customer data. Uh, they, in some cases, purport to do things that they can't really do and don't even attempt to do. But it doesn't matter anyway. All right, I think we got one more for you. We'll squeeze one more in. Also concerning, well, interesting uh, story. Um, where are we? The gatewaypundit.com. So we're hope finally made a comeback. I do not know who we got here. American Gulag, TGP Truth, TGP Video. TGP back chat. Got an anonymous guest contributor. So this is, you know, this is an editorial of some kind. Leo Homan, beware the digital marking. EU moving aggressively to digitize its citizens and the US will also fall in line. Uh, November 11th. Uh, I put it on screen, so I guess we better look at it together. But yeah, take this with a grain of salt. Um, this article originally appeared on Leo Homan's Substack and was later republished with permission. So the guest post, guest contributor here is one Leo Homan. All right, so they want to digitize us. But first, we will experience World War III and economic collapse. As our attention has been swayed toward the Middle East and war in Israel, the globalists are moving at a breakneck speed toward their dream of establishing a truly digital society in which all human beings are tagged, tracked, and graded for everything they do. They have some ads enabled on this uh, site, and apparently I don't have an ad blocker running hard enough to shut them down. It was reported this week that the United Nations, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and partners of the Rockefeller Foundation are launching a campaign to accelerate digital ID. Digital payments, man, what a what a list of uh, fantastic names right there. The, the UN, Bill and Melinda Gates, and the Rockefeller Foundation. So yeah, we got the 20th and the, the, the greatest philanthropists of the 19th and the 20th century. Their campaign to accelerate digital ID, digital payments, and data sharing rollouts in 50 countries by 2028, all under the umbrella of Digital Public Infrastructure, DPI. They call it the 50 in 5 Agenda. They have such catchy names for this. Isn't that cute? He says, I guess the term Great Reset, quote unquote, is already wearing thin on people, so they had to come up with a slick new moniker. You know, yeah, let's never forget that 
they use these labels and terms themselves on everything, like with marketing. <laughs> Uh, the United Nations Development Program, or UNDP, has announced plans to roll out digital IDs worldwide by 2030. That's our agenda 2030 stuff, right? It'll be mandatory for people who wish to participate in society, says Reclaim the Net, which advocates for free speech and individual liberty online. It appears the European Union will be one of the most the more aggressive governmental bodies to move in the direction of digitizing its citizens. Once this is accomplished, the next step will be the digital currency and then a full on social credit scoring system. China is the model for this. It's almost like that is capitalism is dead article is like and that guy's book. It's like just training for, you know, and programming for this same thing. That yeah, has the model for this. The European Parliament and member states have just reached an agreement on the introduction of digital identity. A Dutch MEP reported on November 8th in a post to X. I guess that's Twitter X. That's right. I just left the room. I just left the room where we had negotiations about a digital identity, and I have bad news, announced Dutch member of the European Parliament, Bob Roos, on Wednesday. Once this digital identifier is in place, the next step will be a CBDC, centralized or central bank digital currency. In the Great Reset, a.k.a. New World Order, the dual digitization of currency and human bodies always go together. And Ruse said this is exactly the plan in Europe. On X, in a November 8 post that included a video, he wrote, Breaking, very bad news. The European Parliament and member states just reached an agreement on introducing the digital identity, hashtag EID. Directly afterwards, EU Commissioner Breton said, now that we have a digital identity wallet, we have to put something in it, suggesting a connection between the CBDC and EID. They ignored all the privacy experts and security specialists. They're pushing it all through. I'm not optimistic, but it is not too late yet. Parliament still has to vote about this. Let your MEP know that you oppose the digital identity and that you want your MEP to vote against it. Flash that probably won't. <sighs> Dutch journalist Mark van der Vet begged, stated in a post to X, quote, the citizens of the member states have to vote about this, period. In the Dutch parliament, a large majority was against the EID, but still it has been signed in Brussels by one of our ministers. Pressure will also increase on the United States to join the global system. I reported in April that a bill has been introduced in the United States Senate that if passed would require all Americans to have a digital ID in order to function in society. In my opinion, the US citizenry is not yet ready to go down this path of full digitization, although we are already part way down that path. Biometric facial scans are already being done at many US airports, requiring a face scan before you can board an international flight but I believe it'll take a couple more years of crushing inflation and a bloody World War III experience, at which point Americans would beg their lawmakers for any measure promising them a return to peace and economic normalcy. This is when you'll see the full scope of digitization unfold with mandates similar to what we saw with the vax, only more intense. That already was pretty intense. But digitization will happen much faster in Europe because they have that extra layer of bureaucracy at the regional level, which is able to bypass national resistance. I'll keep scrolling here. You can see there's, you know, a good bit more. Um, so I'm not going to read this guy's whole editorial. It's definitely an editorial. He, you know, goes out on some big statements and Jesus Christ. So... You know, uh, I'm giving him enough uh, platform here. Thegatewaypundit.com, guest contributor Leo Homan, published this yesterday. It's already in the show notes as I speak these words to you, and I'll put it all right out as it is. This is pretty much the uh, conclusion of this news brief. And if I shut up quick enough, we can almost call this a 30-minute broadcast. So... 
Thanks for listening. If you made it this far, please like and subscribe. Share the channel with somebody sometime. And until I talk to you again, smoke some indica. Do shit anyway.